This is the Sabbath School lesson for the first quarter, 2022. Welcome to Lesson 10, Jesus Opens the Way Through the Veil, ready for teaching on March 5. It's part of the series In These Last Days, The Message of Hebrews, authored by Dr. Felix Cortez, who is the Associate Professor of New Testament Literature in the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary at Andrews University. And I'm your reader for today, Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, February 26. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that Jesus appears for us as our Advocate, as our Redeemer, as our Saviour, and that our salvation is assured through Him. And we know that we can trust Him. And this week, as we study more about Him, we pray that our hearts will grow much more fonder, that our minds will be clear, that your Holy Spirit will guide our thinking and our understanding, and may our love for you be greater, we pray in Jesus' name. But also, Lord, today I'd like to pray for those who are listening in Khartoum in Sudan, or those in Launceston, Tasmania, uh, people in Kabul, Afghanistan, listen, uh, in Lahore, in Pakistan, in Jakarta, in Indonesia, in Lincoln, Nebraska, in Quito, Ecuador, in so many places around the world, Lord. People are listening to your word being read each week, and I pray that each person and each family may be blessed as a result. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our memory text this week is Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 24. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Let's read that again. Hebrews 9, 24. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. When the disciples returned from the Mount of Olives, right after Jesus had ascended to heaven, they were filled with joy and triumph. Their master and friend had ascended to a position of power over the world and had invited them to approach God in his name with the absolute confidence that God would respond favourably to their prayers, as you read in John 14, verses 13 to 14. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Even though they continued in the world, attacked by the forces of evil, their hope was strong. They knew that Jesus had ascended to prepare a place for them, as we read in John fourteen one to 3 Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. They knew that Jesus was the captain of their salvation, and that he had opened a way into the heavenly homeland through his blood. The ascension of Jesus to heaven is central to the theology of Hebrews. It marks the beginning of Jesus' rule and the beginning of his high priestly ministry in our behalf. And, more important, Jesus' ascension marks the moment that the new covenant, which provides the means through which we can approach God boldly through faith, has been inaugurated. It is our privilege now to approach God with confidence through Jesus and the merits of his righteousness. Sunday, February 27, Jesus Before the Father Read Hebrews chapter 9, verse 24. According to this passage, 
What was the purpose of Jesus' ascension to heaven? Hebrews 9.24 For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. God instructed Israel that their males should go three times every year up to Jerusalem to appear before the Lord with an offering. The appointed times were the Feast of Passover, or Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Weeks, Pentecost, and the Feast of Booths, as we read in Exodus 23, 14-17. Three times you shall keep a feast for me in the year, you shall keep the Feast of Unleavened Bread, you shall eat unleavened bread seven days, as I commanded you at the time appointed in the month of Abib, for in it you came out of Egypt, none shall appear before me empty." and the feast of harvest, the first fruits of your labours which you have sown in the field, and the feast of ingathering at the end of the year, when you have gathered in the fruit of your labours from the field. And Deuteronomy 16.16 16, Three times a year all your males shall appear before the Lord your God in the place which he chooses, at the feast of unleavened bread, at the feast of weeks, and at the feast of tabernacles, and they shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. Passover celebrated Israel's deliverance from Egypt. Pentecost celebrated the barley harvest, and by the time of the New Testament, it was associated with the giving of the law at Sinai. The Feast of Booths celebrated God's care for Israel during their sojourn in the desert. According to the New Testament, all the Old Testament feasts also have prophetic significance. Hebrews 9.24 describes Jesus' ascension into the presence of the Father. He arrived at the heavenly sanctuary, the true one, in order to appear before God with a better sacrifice, his own blood, as we read in Hebrews 9.23 and 24. Therefore it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with much better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Jesus fulfilled the pilgrimage feast's prophetic significance with amazing accuracy. He died on the day for the preparation of the Passover at the ninth hour, the moment in which Passover lambs were sacrificed. John 19.14 Now it was the preparation day of the Passover, and about the sixth hour, and he said to the Jews, Behold your king. And Matthew 27 verses 45 to 50 Now, from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land, and about the ninth hour Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood there, when they heard that, said, This man is calling for Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a reed, and offered it to him to drink. The rest said, Let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice, and yielded up his spirit. Jesus was resurrected on the third day, and ascended to heaven to receive assurance that his sacrifice had been accepted. As we read in John twenty seventeen. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. And 1 Corinthians fifteen twenty. But now Christ is risen from the dead, and has become the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. When the priest was to wave the sheaf of ripe barley as the first fruits, as we read in Leviticus 23 verses 10 to 12. 
Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land which I give to you and reap its harvest, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. He shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted on your behalf. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And you shall offer on that day when you wave the sheep a male lamb of the first year without blemish, as a burnt offering to the Lord. Then he ascended forty days later to sit at the right hand of God and inaugurate the new covenant on the day of Pentecost, as is recorded in Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2. The purpose of pilgrimage in ancient Israel was to behold the face of God, Psalm 42 verse 2. This meant to experience God's favour, as we read in Psalm 17.15, As for me, I will see your face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake in your likeness. Similarly, the Hebrew expression to seek the face of God meant to ask God for help. As we read in Second Chronicles 7.14, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. And Psalm 27 verse 8, When you said, Seek my face, my heart said to you, Your face, Lord, I will seek. And Psalm 105 verse 4, Seek the Lord and his strength, seek his face evermore. This is the sense in Hebrews of Jesus' ascension. Jesus ascended to God with the perfect sacrifice. Jesus also ascended to heaven as our forerunner into the presence of God, as you read in Hebrews six nineteen and 20. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. He has made real the promise for the believers who journey, seeking a homeland, desiring a better country, looking forward to the city whose architect and builder is God, as we find in Hebrews 11 verses 10 and 13 to 16. Let's read those verses. Hebrews 11 verse 10, For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. And verses 13 to 16, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. And so to finish today, again, why should the reality of what Jesus has done, not only on the cross, but also what he is doing now in heaven, Give us assurance of salvation. Monday, February 28. God's Invitation. Read Hebrews chapter 12, verses 18 to 21. What was the experience of Israel at Mount Sinai? Hebrews 12, beginning at verse 18. For you have not come to the mountain that may be touched and that burned with fire, and to blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet, and the voice of words, so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them any more. For they could not endure what was commanded, and if so much as a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned or shot with an arrow. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I am exceedingly afraid and trembling. 
When God called the Israelites from Egypt, His plan was to create a personal, intimate relationship with them. He said in Exodus 19, 3 and 4, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to Myself. Thus, through Moses, God gave the necessary instructions to prepare the people to meet with Him. The people needed to consecrate themselves first. We read in Exodus chapter 19, verses 10 to 15. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes. And let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day the Lord will come down from Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. You shall set bounds for the people all around, saying, Take heed to yourselves that you do not go up to the mountain or touch its base. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. Not a hand shall touch him, but he shall surely be stoned or shot with an arrow, whether man or beast, he shall not live. When the trumpet sounds long, they shall come near the mountain. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people and sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes. And he said to the people, Be ready for the third day, do not come near your wives. Those who ascended to the foot of the mountain without preparation would die. Nevertheless, once the people had prepared themselves for two days, then, as it said in verse 13, when the trumpet sounds a long blast, on the third day God instructed that the people shall come up to the mountain. He wanted them to have the experience Moses and the leaders of the people would have when they ascended the mountain and beheld God and ate and drank in his presence, as we read in Exodus 24, verses 9 to 11. Then Moses went up also Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel. And there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone, and it was like the very heavens in its clarity. But on the nobles of the children of Israel he did not lay his hand, so they saw God, and they ate and drank. The people later recognised that they had seen God's glory and that it was possible for God to speak, as it says in Deuteronomy 5.24, with man, and man still live. But when the moment came, they lacked faith. Moses explained years later in Deuteronomy 5.5, You were afraid because of the fire, and you did not go up into the mountain. Instead, they asked Moses to be their intermediary. As we read in Deuteronomy 5.25-27, Now therefore, why should we die? For this great fire will consume us. If we hear the voice of the Lord our God any more, then we shall die. For who is there of all flesh who has heard the voice of the living God speaking from the midst of the fire, as we have, and lived? You go near and hear all that the Lord our God may say, and tell us all that the Lord our God says to you, and we will hear and do it. And Exodus 20 verses 18 to 21. Now all the people witnessed the thunderings, the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. Then they said to Moses, You speak with us and we will hear, but let not God speak with us lest we die. And Moses said to the people, Do not fear, For God has come to test you, and that his fear may be before you, so that you may not sin. So the people stood afar off, but Moses drew near the thick darkness where God was. God's manifestation of his holiness at Mount Sinai was to teach the people to learn to fear or respect him. The fear of the Lord leads to life, wisdom, and honour, as we read in Deuteronomy 4, verse 10. Especially concerning the day you stood before the Lord, your God in Horeb, when the Lord said to me, Gather the people to me, and I will let them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days they live on the earth, and that they may teach their children. And Psalm 111, verse 10, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. 
a good understanding have all those who do his commandments, his praise endures for ever. And Proverbs 1 verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. And Proverbs 9 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. And Proverbs 10 27, The fear of the Lord prolongs days, but the years of the wicked will be shortened. And also to the lesson that he is merciful and gracious, as we read in Exodus 34, verses 4 to 8. So he cut two tables of stone like the first ones. Then Moses rose early in the morning and went up to Mount Sinai, as the Lord had commanded him. And he took in his hands the two tables of stone. Now the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord and the Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, having mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. So, So Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. Thus, while God wanted Israel to come to him, the people became afraid and requested for Moses to be their intermediary. The description in Hebrews of the events at Sinai follows. Primarily, Moses reminded to the people of their lack of faith and their apostasy with the golden calf and how he was afraid of meeting God because of their sin, as he said in Deuteronomy 9 and verse 19. For I was afraid of the anger and hot displeasure with which the Lord was angry with you to destroy you, but the Lord listened to me at that time also. The people's reaction was not God's plan for them. It was instead the result of their faithlessness. So to finish the day, because of Jesus, why should we not be afraid to draw near to a holy God? What are the conditions, however, for us to be able to draw near? Tuesday, March 1. The Need for a Veil Veils have a double function. The term Hebrews uses for veil, kateperasama, could refer to the screen of the court, as in Exodus 38.18, which reads, The screen for the gate of the court was woven of purple, blue and scarlet thread, and of fine woven linen. The length was twenty cubits, and the height along its width was five cubits, corresponding to the hangings of the court. The screen at the entrance of the outer apartment of the sanctuary, in Exodus 36, verse 37, he also made a screen for the tabernacle door of blue, purple and scarlet thread and fine woven linen made by a weaver. Or the inner veil that separated the holy place from the holy of holies, We read in Exodus 26, verses 31 to 35, You shall make a veil woven of blue, purple and scarlet thread and fine woven linen. It shall be woven with an artistic design of cherubim. You shall hang it upon the four pillars of acacia wood overlaid with gold. Their hooks shall be gold upon four sockets of silver, and you shall hang the veil from the clasps. Then you shall bring the Ark of the Testimony in there behind the veil. The veil shall be a divider for you between the holy place and the most holy. You shall put the mercy seat upon the Ark of the Testimony in the most holy. You shall set the table outside the veil and the lampstand across from the table on the side of the tabernacle toward the south, and you shall put the table on the north side." These three veils were both entrances and boundaries that only some people could cross. 
Read Leviticus 16, verses 1 and 2, and Leviticus 10, 1 to 3. What warning do we have in these passages? Leviticus 16, beginning at verse 1. Now the Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron, when they had offered profane fire before the Lord and died. And the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron your brother not to come at just any time into the holy place inside the veil, before the mercy seat which is on the ark, lest he die, for I will appear in the cloud above the mercy seat. And Leviticus 10, 1-3, Then Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it, put incense on it, and offered profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. And Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord spoke, saying, For those who come near me... I must be regarded as holy, and before all the people I must be glorified. So Aaron held his peace. The veil was a protection for the priests as they ministered before a holy God. After the sin of the golden calf, God said to Moses that he would not accompany them in the way to the promised land, lest he consume them, because they were a stiff-necked people in Exodus 33 verse 3. Thus Moses moved the tent of meeting and pitched it far off outside the camp in Exodus 33 and verse 7. After Moses interceded, however, God agreed to go with them in their midst in Exodus 33 verses 12 to 20, but he established several measures to protect the people as he dwelt among them. Let's read Exodus chapter 33 verses 12 to 20. Then Moses said to the Lord, See you say to me, Bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found grace in my sight. Now therefore I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way, that I may know you, and that I may find grace in your sight, and consider that this nation is your people. And he said, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Then he said to him, If your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. For how then will it be known that your people and I have found grace in your sight, except you go with us? So we shall be separate, your people and I, from all the people who are upon the face of the earth. So the Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing that you have spoken, for you have found grace in my sight, and I know you by name. And he said, Please show me your glory. Then he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, You cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. For instance, Israel camped in a strict order that created a hollow square in the middle where the tabernacle was pitched. In addition, the Levites camped around the tabernacle in order to protect the sanctuary and its furniture from encroachment by strangers, as you read in Numbers 1, 51. And when the tabernacle is to go forward, the Levites shall take it down, and when the tabernacle is to be set up, the Levites shall set it up. The outsider who comes near shall be put to death, and Numbers 3.10. So you shall appoint Aaron and his sons, and they shall attend to their priesthood, but the outsider who comes near shall be put to death. They were, in fact, a kind of human veil that protected the people of Israel. But, as it says in Numbers 1.53, the Levites shall camp around the tabernacle of the testimony, so that there may be no wrath on the congregation of the people of Israel, and the Levites shall keep guard over the tabernacle of the testimony. Jesus, as our high priest, also has been our veil. Through his incarnation, God pitched his tent in our midst, and made it possible for us to contemplate his glory, as we read in John 1, verses 14 to 18, And the word became flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. 
John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, but he was before me. And of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. He made it possible for a holy God to live in the midst of an imperfect people. And so to finish today, think about what it meant that the Creator God, the one who made the universe, would dwell among his people, who at that time were a nation of escaped slaves. What does that teach us about how close God can be to us? Wednesday, March 2, The New and Living Way Through the Veil Read Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 to 22. What invitation do we have in this passage? Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. The book of Hebrews argues that Jesus has entered into the heavenly sanctuary and invites us to follow his lead. This idea agrees with the conception introduced before that Jesus is the captain and forerunner of believers, as we read in Hebrews 2.10. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. And Hebrews 6 verses 19 and 20, This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to to the order of Melchizedek, and Hebrews 12, verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The new and living way is the new covenant that Jesus inaugurated with his sacrifice and ascension. The expression new and living contrasts with the description of the old covenant as obsolete and growing old in Hebrews 8, 13, in that he says a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. Now, what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. It is the new covenant which has provided forgiveness of sin and has put the law in our hearts that makes it possible for us to approach God with confidence, not because of ourselves or anything we have done, but only because of what Jesus has done for us by fulfilling all the covenant obligations. Hebrews noted that the inauguration of the Old Covenant involved the inauguration of the sanctuary and the consecration of the priests, as we read in Hebrews 9, verses 18 to 21. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet wool and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. Then likewise he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And in Exodus chapter 40, Leviticus Leviticus chapter 8 and Leviticus chapter 9, we have a description of what Moses was told by God about how the services were to occur on a daily basis. 
The purpose of the covenant was to create an intimate relationship between God and his people. As we read in Exodus 19, verses 4 to 6, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation." These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. When the Israelites accepted this relationship, God immediately commanded that a sanctuary be built so that he could live among them. The inauguration of the sanctuary and God's presence in the midst of his people marked the moment when the covenant between God and Israel was completed. The same is true of the new covenant. The New Covenant also implies the inauguration of Jesus' priestly ministry in our behalf, which we'll read in Hebrews 5 and Hebrews 7. First of all, Hebrews 5, verses 1 to 10. For every high priest taken from among men is appointed for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can have compassion on those who are ignorant and going astray, since he himself is also subject to weakness. Because of this, he is required, as for the people, so also for himself, to offer sacrifices for sins. And no man takes this honour to himself, but he who is called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest, but it was he who said to him, You are my son, today I have have begotten you. And he also says in another place, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and was heard because of his godly fear, though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him, called by God as high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek. And Hebrews 7, 1 to chapter 8, verse 13. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. Now, consider how great this man was, to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. And indeed, those who are of the sons of Levi, who receive the priesthood, have a commandment to receive tithes from the people according to the law, that is, from their brethren, though they have come from the loins of Abraham. But he whose genealogy is not derived from them received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. Now, now, beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better. Here, mortal men receive tithes, but there he receives them, of whom it is witnessed that he lives. Even Eli, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, so to speak, for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should arise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be called according to the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed of necessity, there is also a change of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe, from which no man has officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. And it is yet far more evident if in the likeness of Melchizedek there arises another priest who has come, not according to the law of a fleshly commandment, but according to the power of an endless life. For he testifies, You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, there is an annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness, for the law made nothing perfect. 
On the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. And, inasmuch as he was not made priest without an oath, for they have become priests without an oath, but he with an oath by him who said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not relent, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. By so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. Also, there were many priests, because they were prevented by death from continuing. But he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily, as those high priests, to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the people's, for this he did once for all, when he offered up himself. For the law appoints as high priests men who have weakness, but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints the Son who has been perfected for ever. Now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord erected and not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one also have something to offer. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, See that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But, Now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second, because, finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind, and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbour and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know the Lord, from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. In that, he says, a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. Now, what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Jesus' ascension before God has inaugurated a new era for the people of God. Zechariah 3 mentions that Satan was in the presence of God to accuse God's people, who were represented by the high priest Joshua. This accuser is the same that raised questions about Job's loyalty to God in Job 1 and Job 2. With the sacrifice of Jesus, however, Satan has been cast out of heaven, as we read in Revelation 12, 7 to 12. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come, for the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before our God day and night, has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short 
time. And we'll compare this with John 12.31. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And John 16.11. Of judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. Now, it is Jesus who intercedes for us, and through his sacrifice and faithfulness, claims salvation for us. And so to finish today, what accusations could Satan make against you before God, if he were allowed? Though he is a liar, how much would he have to lie about you in order to seek your condemnation? What is your only hope? Thursday, March 3, they will see his face. Read Hebrews chapter 12, verses 22 to 24. In what sense have we arrived at the heavenly Jerusalem into the presence of God? But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. It is argued that believers have come to Mount Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem, through faith. In this sense, their experience anticipates the future. Thus, the heavenly Jerusalem belongs to the realms of the things hoped for and not seen, but nevertheless assured to us through faith, as we read in Hebrews 11.1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, for the evidence of things not seen. While true, this is not the whole meaning of this passage. We also have arrived at Mount Zion in the very presence of God through our representative Jesus, as we read in Ephesians 2, 5 and 6. Even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And Colossians 3, verse 1, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Jesus' ascension is not a matter of faith, but of fact. It is this historical dimension of Jesus' ascension that provides compelling force to the exhortation of Hebrews to hold fast to our confession, as you read in Hebrews 4.14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. And Hebrews 10.23, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Paul says, Since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, let us with confidence draw near in chapter 4 verse 14 and verse 16 reads seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens jesus the son of god let us hold fast our confession for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need Thus, we already have arrived through our representative and therefore should act accordingly. Through him, we have tasted the heavenly gift and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come in Hebrews 6 verses 4 and 5. The reality of Jesus' ascension and ministry in the heavenly sanctuary is, as it says in Hebrews 6.19, a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. The guarantee that the promises have substance and are worthy of confidence, as you read in Hebrews 7.22. By so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. For us, 
faith has a historical anchor. God's purpose will be fulfilled not only in Jesus, however, but also in us. We have said that Jesus' ascension fulfilled the typology of the first two yearly pilgrimages of Israel, Passover and Pentecost. According to Hebrews and the book of Revelation, the last pilgrimage, the Feast of Booths, is yet to be fulfilled. We will celebrate it with Jesus when we are in the city whose architect and builder is God, in the heavenly homeland, as it says in Hebrews 11.10. And we'll also look at Hebrews 11, verses 13 to 16. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things, declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. We will not build booths, but God's booth or tent will descend from heaven, and we will live with him forever. As we read in Revelation seven fifteen to 17 Therefore they are before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. They will neither hunger any more, nor thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any heat. For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of waters. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And Revelation chapter 21 verses 1 to 4. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. And Revelation 22, verses 1 to 5, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street, and on either side of the river, was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations, and there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign for ever and ever. And number 6, verses 24 to 26. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And so to finish today, how can we learn to make the promise of eternal life real to ourselves now amid a world so full of pain and suffering? What answer can you give to those who say that this all is just a fantasy to help us feel better about our life here and now? Friday, March 4. From the book The Acts of the Apostles, page 38 and 46, Ellen White writes, Christ's ascension to heaven was the signal that his followers were to receive the promised blessing. For this they were to wait before they entered upon their work. 
When Christ passed within the heavenly gates, he was enthroned amid the adoration of the angels. As soon as this ceremony was completed, the Holy Spirit descended upon the disciples in rich currents, and Christ was indeed glorified, even with the glory which he had with the Father from all eternity. The Pentecostal outpouring was heaven's communication that the Redeemer's inauguration was accomplished. According to his promise, he had sent the Holy Spirit from heaven to his followers as a token that he had, as priest and king, received all authority in heaven and on earth, and was the anointed one over his people. They could speak the name of Jesus with assurance, for was he not their friend and elder brother? Brought into close communion with Christ, they sat with him in heavenly places. With what burning language they clothed their ideas as they bore witness for him. End of quote. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. 1. The psalmist said, My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Psalm 42 verse 2. How can we have the same thirst to come into the presence of God? If we don't rejoice now in the presence of God as we worship Him and come before His presence in faith, will we rejoice in the future? What are the factors that lead to joy before God? 2. In a book mocking faith, someone created a robot that supposedly did our believing for us. Though this was a spoof, how can we be careful not to do as Israel did in the desert, and that is to make a request for intermediaries between us and God? We tend to allow other people to study the Bible in our behalf and find the gems of truth in the Bible. Some people may feel tempted to think that the prayers of others in their behalf carry more weight before God than their own prayers. Why should we avoid this spiritual trap? Why, because of Jesus, can we approach God without the need of anyone else? 3. Hebrews is about assurance of salvation. How, though, must we be careful not to mistake presumption for assurance? Inside Story. Our mission story this week is titled God is the Best Witness, and it's by Anna Licole. At the age of 18, I longed to share Jesus with others, but I was afraid. Then I needed surgery, and I was hospitalized in Tula, a city about two and a half hours by car from Russia's capital, Moscow. Three of the six beds in my room were occupied when I arrived. My operation was scheduled for the next day. What should I do? What does someone do before an operation? I thought, I opened my Bible. The woman across from me immediately asked, Are you a Christian? Yes, I said. She then wanted to know which church I went to. I didn't want to be mocked for being a Seventh-day Adventist. Many Russians belong to another Christian denomination and dismiss Adventists as members of a sect. I'm a Protestant, I said. The woman wasn't satisfied. Which Protestant church do you belong to, she said. What could I say? I'm a Seventh-day Adventist, I said. Wow, a Seventh-day Adventist, she exclaimed. I know Adventists. They are the best people. The woman spoke enthusiastically about the church, its work, and Zosky Adventist University located outside Chula. The two other patients listened silently. They had never heard about the Adventist church. Adventists are good Christians, the woman said. My father knows some nice Adventists. As she spoke, the physician entered the room. He was surprised to see her. What are you doing here? he asked. What do you mean? she replied. I ordered you to be discharged yesterday, he said. You should already be at home. Her husband picked her up within thirty minutes. God had answered my prayers in an unexpected way. He revealed himself on his own in my hospital room. 
God has done everything. As a result, the other patients knew I was an Adventist and that Adventists love Jesus. If you long to share him, he can arrange it. He will do everything for you. And there's a lovely photograph of her just to the left here on the page. This mission story illustrates mission objective number one of the Seventh-day Adventist Church's I Will Go strategic plan to revive the concept of worldwide mission and sacrifice for mission as a way of life involving not only pastors but every church member, young and old, in the joy of witnessing for Christ and making disciples. Learn more at IWillGo2020.org This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. Sponsored by the Sabbath School Department and distributed through Hope Channel Australia, this podcast is also redistributed by Hope Channel Germany, Christian Record Services for the Blind, and It Is Written. It is also available on SoundCloud and through multiple podcast distributors, including Apple iTunes. Remember, God is always faithful.